So, hello everybody and welcome to the Great Degrowth Book Debate. My name is Lina, I am part of the Post Growth Institute, and I will be co-hosting this event tonight together with Yefim, a PhD researcher at the University of Leeds and a climate and social justice activist. So, um, tonight we are joined by some of the authors of three awesome degrowth books that have been published this year. Oh, oh no. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, all right. So we have three great books uh, present today. We have Susan Paulson and Giacomo de Alisa, who are two other authors of the book, The Case for Degrowth. Welcome, Susan and Giacomo. We also have Vincent Leger, one of the authors of the book, Exploring Degrowth. Welcome, Vincent. And finally, we have Nina Tro and Matthias Schmelzer, two of the authors of the book, Degrowth in Movements. Welcome, Nina and Matthias. Behind the scenes, we also have Lorenzo, Eva, Kat and Gabi from the Degrowth Talks team. Big thank you to all of them. So we will be kicking off tonight's debate with a short presentation of each of the three books. And tonight, the authors have gone above and beyond and did not only bring their books, but also some degrowth poetry, some degrowth limericks of which we will be seeing a world premiere tonight. After their presentations, we will then start the debate with our five authors, first asking a few questions that we have prepared before taking questions and comments from the audience. So if you are watching this and you have any questions or comments you would like to direct at the authors, please put them in the YouTube chat at any time. At the end of the night, we will then be voting for the best degrowth limerick, but not only amongst the limericks by our panelists, we will also be inviting you guys who are watching this live to write your own limericks and throw it into the competition. So if you are feeling poetic, please put your limerick in the YouTube chat. And for those of you who don't know what a limerick is, we have put some instructions in the YouTube bio, which should be just below. You will get some bonus points if you write your discussion question as a limerick. Um, now, while you are all hopefully getting excited for tonight's uh, spectacles, we need to interrupt our degrowth visions with some of the unfortunate necessities of our capitalist reality, in which unfortunately, not only degrowth talks, but indeed also money talks. You might see where this is going. We need your help. Um, that is, we need the support of all of you watching this at home, whether you're watching it live or at a later point. So the Deep Growth Talks team is uh, a collective of young activists and researchers who are working on a completely voluntary basis. But running our activities, like uh, the long list of Deep Growth Talks that we have already organized, and of course, also tonight's great degrowth book debate does incur a range of expenses like uh, live streaming and web services, animations, video editing and things like this. And we thought that there would be no better way to fund our activities than by being helped by many small donations from our supportive community. So therefore, we set up a crowdfunding campaign and we hope that any of you that are able to would consider donating to it. In the end, any amount helps, even if it's just two or three euros, because it adds up if more people do it. Um, the crowdfunding will help us to continue our project of popular education and to spread the degrowth message and ideas beyond academia, which we believe is the key requirement for realizing the kind of societies that we aspire to, which are societies that enable a good life for all within planetary boundaries. We are already planning an animated Digo short film, as well as a series of sh short social media friendly videos speaking to key Digo questions and issues. So please donate if and what you can, and the link to the crowdfunding campaign on the page co-op funding can also be found in the bio below. Then, without further ado, the first book we will hear about tonight is The Case for Digo. It was written by Georgos Kallis, Susan Paulson, Giacomo da Alisa, and Federico de Maria. 
And we are really lucky and happy to have both Susan and Giacomo with us here tonight. Susan is an anthropologist based at the University of Florida, where she studies and teaches about gender, class, and ethno-racial systems. Giacomo is a political ecologist based at the University of Coimbra, where he studies commons and commoning and his role in changing the world. The book has received a lot of praise. For example, Mike Davis from the University of California says that there is only one cure consistent with global social justice. Read this eloquent and urgent book and find out what it is. We are excited to hear what you have to say, Susan and Giacomo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lina, and thank you all the Big Road Talk uh, team. This is a great initiative, and uh, um, I really appreciate your effort to make this possible. Um, I will start uh, in the next 10 minutes. Uh, Susan and myself will present a little bit the, the book, but we, we decide also to focus on um, simple, clear messages in the first part, because what do we really would like to, to see this night is the, an enjoyable discussion with all our companions in this great uh, process. Uh, indeed, it's uh, fantastic to be part of uh, a, um, a great number of people that are collaborating, thinking, practicing the degrowth uh, uh, imaginary that uh, uh, we want to, to see implemented. So um, without further uh, uh, thankful uh, words, I, I want to just introduce a little bit the book. Uh, the the case for degrowth and um, in my five minutes I, I want to just to, to share with you my initial thought uh, when we start to thinking about the case for degrowth and uh, it will sound a little bit strange perhaps but uh, uh, I, when I was thinking at the beginning uh, how to start and uh, what what to write in, in, together uh, with my colleagues in this book, I was wondering if it was possible to think about uh, a case for the growth that um, uh, without, without focusing on economy and climate change. Uh, I know it's strange, but I think it's, uh, it's um, a, a, above all for, for what uh, concern economy. Um, the discussion about uh, the economic transformation is somehow very noisy. Uh, and uh, uh, force uh, many degrowthers to explain that, for example, recession is not degrowth. No, uh, so I was thinking to to if uh, we could really make an effort to to transmit the very central idea that degrowth is not just about economy; is to think about a different society, a different organization. A, a different uh, way to stay uh, in our world. So this is even more important uh, um, now because uh, uh, currently, for example, when I've been invited to present already uh, locally or in different uh, international contexts, the book, many, many times, e um, every discussion starts on you know, uh, the economic configuration that we want to see. And I think uh, this is uh, somehow problematic. And wh what we tried indeed uh, to do in, in this book and, um, was uh, uh, indeed try to avoid any economicisms, the uh, discourses, no? To, to focus on uh, economy because uh, also the relation between uh, uh, economy and the contents of the economy always shift any discourse on quantity, no? It's like when you speak about economy, you have to speak about uh, a number that uh, perhaps grow or perhaps uh, descend. And this is very problematic because indeed what we have tried to, to, uh, to show at the beginning uh, in the first part of the book is that uh, we, we need to think about it, um, it, the quality of the society that we want to envision above all. No? Yeah, it's not indeed uh, just a matter of saying, you know, 
the selective growth discussion, you know, we need to increase the good things like hospital and we need to uh, decrease uh, the bad things like uh, um, uh, factory that are contaminating. Well, I think it's even uh, problematic to think now in COVID time, uh, simply of, you know, to have a better world um, beyond the pandemic to think uh, that we just need more bed in the hospitals. I think we need a different kind of also consideration about health issue. No? And this is what we try to do with, the, with this book. And this is why I think the case for the growth is different uh, from other books that we have been uh, involved in, uh, myself and Susan, uh, that indeed try to transmit uh, an idea uh, again of a different society and, and, uh, and above all a discussion about the quality of the transformation that we need. And this is my uh, contribution to this and I, I leave the floor to Susan. Great. Uh, Degrowth Talk team, you are where it's at. I just love your lively convivial opportunity to imagine futures together. So synergies and also tensions among our different books are really vital for advancing degrowth on multiple sites. We need to do everyday practices, relationships, values, concepts, design, myths, policies, social and political movements. One thing that our book tries to do is promote a set of policies, Green New Deals, reduced working hours, universal basic incomes, accessible services, and especially support of community economies and commonings. We've been quite surprised happily that partly in response to activist demands in the face of COVID, some governance are already starting to consider and implement some of these proposals. However, even the best policies will not succeed without deep social and cultural transformations. I'm an anthropologist. We think about depth and breadth of human experience, observing that during millennia, a rainbow of kinship, gender, ethnic, religious systems have operated to sustain and regenerate human and other natural resources. That's been the main goal of being human, pretty much. During recent dissemination of colonial capitalization, capitalism, these systems were co-opted to facilitate expanding exploitation of human and other resources for profit. So in our book, we try to look at some of the mechanisms through that happened. One is racialization of certain human groups, labeling them as inferior, which justifies appropriation of their labor and resources. Another is the heteronormative nuclear family, pushed forward, prescribed as a unit of production and reproduction, and especially gender systems that have come to extol market production as a sign of superior masculinity and relegate care and reproduction, the whole thing of life, to inferior feminine realms. Assimilation and liberal feminist efforts to empower non-white people and women by moving them into those productivist roles that gain power have certainly helped in large economies. But we actually think they haven't done so much to bring about the kind of resilient and equitable worlds that we think, that we seek, right? So we're asking how can we support moves that build towards the regeneration of life rather than the generation of market value. One of our main options is learning from communities and experiences around the world that embrace and exercise principles long at the core of human cultures, care, and regeneration of common goods. The most basic common goods are human communities, our cultures and our natural environments, right? So one of the things we're trying to sort of balance is respect that planetary boundaries demand that we actually reduce the total material and energy used by economies, but also propose investing actually more in different places around the world and in our societies in infrastructures and activities that support care, provisioning, and solidarity, so that a wild diversity of more nurturing options can sort of strengthen and thrive. In conclusion, we would like to see societies become slower and more caring by design, not disaster. However, it looks more likely that transitions would be unplanned, messy, conditions we don't choose, like the ones we're living in right now. 
COVID-19 has laid bare inadequacies and inequalities in, in, our, in our current systems. And it's also provoked a, a lovely and rich surge of collaborative caring initiatives. Sadly, neither of those is gonna be sufficient to change the arc of current politics away from growth. Uh, there's already status quo actors pushing to reconstitute the normal, the way things were, right? I love that they call it normal. Um, anyway, also we're worried because our abilities to ally in resistance are undermined by politics of fear, surveillance, xenophobia, blame, isolation. That's why I really, again, I'm so grateful to those of you who have made an effort to bring us all together to try to gain strength from solidarity, even in these isolating times. Because any kinds of transformation is gonna require alliance amongst everybody. And that's why the Degrowth Movement book is great because it encourages us to think that even though now we're often divided by antagonistic politics, there's a ton of people that could be our allies and positions, nature lovers, care providers, families with children, biking fanatics, vegans, overworked professionals, hippies, unemployed people, elderly people, climate refugees, anti-colonial activists. You know, how can we all get together and, and learn and forge some kind of alliance that may be heterodox and heterogeneous, but also gain strength from each other? And our most immediate case for including degrowth, especially kind of feminist degrowth in this allied front with all of you, and I hope listeners, is that its fundamental practices are desirable in themselves. Modest living in cooperation and caring, convivial sharing, building equitable and solidarity communities, regenerating eco-social environments, even with no political victory in sight, people in wildly diverse contexts are already exercising and embodying caring degrowth worlds. So I'm gonna to end today by sharing our limerick attempt. Giacomo and I work together on this and we ask, how can endless expansion seem logical? We dream beyond new systems economical. Not a downward trip, nor losing our grip. Degrowth worlds are more equitable and ecological. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan and Giacomo. That was, uh, that was brilliant. <laughs> very much loved the, the limerick as, as well. Um, so as, as you have seen now, and as you will see later today, uh, one of the elements that we're trying to bridge here is, is sort of the, the realm of ideas and the realm of art and poetry. Um, so thanks again for your um, beautiful presentations. And we will now move, move to the next book um, that we'll hear about today. And that is Exploring Degrowth, a critical guide by Vincent Léger and Anitra Nelson. And we're very excited to have uh, Vincent with us here tonight. Welcome again, uh, Vincent. Uh, so Vincent is a degrowth activist and organizer, a spokesperson for the French and international degrowth movements, and also an engineer and independent researcher. Um, he's also a coordinator of Carbonomia in Budapest, um, which is a center for research and experimentation on degrowth in Budapest. Um, Vincent and Anitra's book, which we're about to hear uh, about, has been praised by, for example, by Ariel Sela um, as a superbly written reflection on degrowth politics. So now we're looking forward to hear a superbly spoken reflection on degrowth politics. Nasa, the floor is yours. So thanks a lot, Jeffrey, and thanks a lot to all of you for organizing this uh, fantastic talk. Uh, first, I would like to send my greetings to Anitra, who couldn't join us tonight, because without Anitra, I wouldn't be here tonight. It was really, um, the book really emerged from our meeting, and it, uh, we met, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, in the same time, in the autumn in Budapest, when Anitra came with Francois Schneider to present her book, uh, our former group, Housing, Degrowth, Housing for Degrowth. And um, we, we were together in a discussion in, a, in, in this type of intellectual bars just next to where I am and which are closed because of this dystopian lockdown. And um, we had a debate uh, about degrowth approaches and so on. And, and to be honest, since we started degrowth into English, I felt a bit the frustration that a lot of things which were already debated in the French degrowth movement were never translated properly into the Anglo-Saxon world. And on the contrary, uh, dialogue was not so good for when I start to uh, speak about degrowth in English and Anglo-Saxon world and what we started to organize around the, 
international degrees conference, when I went back to France to my French friends, they were not so much interested in that. And there was no good links, no good bridges between both and so on. And when we met with Anitra, we realized that it would be very interesting and very important to translate what I experienced and what we experienced together with the French degrees movement and try to, uh, uh, to, to, to put it in an understandable and meaningful way into the Anglo-Saxon uh, context. So we were quite complementary for that. I brought the, what happened in the French degrees movement and Anitra uh, helped me to, uh, to make it meaningful in the Anglo-Saxon uh, context to explain to me, yeah, we should speak more about that. We should explain more that because it's unknown and so on. And that's how the, the ID started. So we made this book, and I, I, I will just present quickly some ideas you could find in the book, which are, I think, type of complementary ideas uh, to the books which are also presented tonight. And I, I really believe I had the opportunity to read all the books which just been published, and I really believe that they are totally complementary. And we could have time to time some small debates and details, but uh, it's converging, and, and, um, and we are just putting focus on different points. And I will follow the five main parts of our book. Uh, the first one, and I think it's quite interesting, and, and I still feel close to degrowth and the world because we go back to the origin of the world, which started in France, décroissance. And um, it's something which is quite powerful because uh, in the last 20 years, we, we used it the first time in 2002, so 18 years ago to be precise, we could see emerging a lot of slogans, a lot of words, a lot of uh, uh, ideas um, to defend the same type of ideas or solution or debates that you will find in degrees. And one after the other one, all of them have been co-opted by the system. All of them have been reappropriated, have been uh, emptied from its content. And it's not by chance that uh, uh, the word décroissance, translated later in 2008 degrees in English, was chosen because we wanted to have a word uh, and it was the idea of somebody coming from a uh, as a marketing advertisement business, he said that we need a world which is not appropriable by the system because they are already doing it with sustainable development. And after we could see that with everything, if you watch advertisement nowadays, you will find a lot of concept or principle you will find in degrees to sell you a car, to sell you a, a, a junk food or whatsoever. And the world is still here, the world is still going on, but the world is still producing the same type of misunderstandings and debates and question, and we go back in the first chapter, in particular with that experience, we, which is a bit longer than in English, in, in France, we go back to whether it's a good world, a bad world, what the good points, what is missing in the world, what kind of confusion it creates, and, and so on. But it's very interesting to go back to the history of the world to understand why we are here tonight to speak about this uh, strange world degrowth in a gross religion model of society. The second part, and uh, Giacomo said somehow something about that. It's called decolonizing our gross imaginaries. And it's really about that. Even if degrowth started uh, with more hard science, and I'm an engineer, and I started to join degrowth in studying peak oil and peak everything, and, and, um, and how our model of society is physically, energetically uh, reaching the, its limits, I think the most interesting part of degrowth is to connect these physical limits to the cultural limits to growth. and also through this invitation, and Suzanne said she's an anthropologist, and I think since the beginning of Degros, anthropologists and historians of civilization and so on played a, played a very, very important role in constructing Degros. And we go back to what Professor Serge Latouche uh, presents as a matrix of sorts. And what you can find, and I think we should make this effort to, to translate these books into English as well, what you can find in a collection uh, directed by Professor Latouche, which is called The Pioneers of Degrowth. And each book, it's a 100-page book about uh, one person who participated in constructing one part of Degrowth, one person who influenced the Degrowth debate. And you will find people we often quote, like uh, uh, Ivan Illich, like Cornelius Castoriadis, like uh, um, uh, Jacques Ellul, like uh, André Gors, like Françoise Dobon, one of the mothers of ecofeminism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And degrowth is really how to articulate all these ideas, all this past, all these debates. I mean, we are not inventing so much with degrowth. We rather try to go back to a lot of things that we forgot about, a lot of debates which were uh, destroyed by uh, the emergence of our gross model of society, by this there is no alternative principle. And, and this 
uh, journey into the past, into a lot of other religions, spiritualities, uh, civilization, ideas, theories, philosophies, authors, and so on, is really helping us to decolonize our imaginaries and, and uh, is really helping us to construct strong theoretical cultural um, pillars toward transitions to, uh, uh, to degrowth. The third part is more degrowth in practice. Uh, I would say that we, um, it's a very short introduction to what you may find in a degrowth in movements book, but they, de they develop much more the interconnection between degrowth and other movements. And we also develop this idea that uh, to be degrowth or to connect to degrowth, it's to assume the fact that you will be involved in different levels of action from individual, collective, political resistance, and so on. And what makes degrowth so interesting and consequent, it's how do we um, connect all these levers, all these movements, all these um, uh, approaches, all these cultures of uh, activism, of uh, debates, of uh, proposing things and so on. And degrowth is playing this role to be an umbrella uh, movement or an umbrella network, trying to connect the people to implement debates and so on. And so we, we develop it uh, in this part. The fourth part, uh, I think it's something which is less debated in the Anglo-Saxon world degrowth part, even if uh, the main authors who influenced us was um, writing in English. It's uh, political strategies for degrowth. And in France, we ended up with a strong debate on how to change the world, how to implement degrowth without taking the power. Because if you take power, you will be taken by the power. But not to take power doesn't mean that you let it in the hands of Viktor Orban, where I am here, or Macron, or Joe Biden, and so on. It means that um, you you should create another way to construct all the type of counter power, counter power, and so on, in protecting yourself from the power gains, which are destructive. And um, we question what could be a degrowth strategy uh, from this point of view, and how degrowth, and it's also based on what we can analyze from the French degrowth movement, how degrowth has always been powerful in influencing the debate and always. Uh, been or was or maintained or collapsed when it wanted to to grow somehow and uh, the main goal of degrowth is maybe to influence the debate to uh, to grow in the cultural transformation and not to grow in in the power game which is offered by the system and the last uh, part of the book is the degrowth project and it's uh, uh, mostly coming from the what emerged in the french degrowth movement and what we put in the book with my french co-authors uh, a book called Projet de Croissance, a, a degrowth project around the idea of the conditional autonomy allowance, which is something which is going to uh, uh, a lot of ideas which were developed into um, uh, the Anglo-Saxon literature between uh, unconditional basic income, uh, unconditional basic services, uh, the commons, uh, how to rethink democracy and how to create another type of much more deliberative or direct democracy on the commons and so on. And the idea of unconditional autonomy allowance, the type of package bringing together all these ideas, uh, offering from birth to death to all unconditionally uh, what we consider democratically as enough to have a decent life. And it's uh, not like an unconditional basic income because it's mostly decommodified. And it's an invitation to democratically re-embed the economy, to decommodify our society, and to um, really question seriously what really matter what do we produce? What do we consume for what kind of use? And to create a new ways in relocalizing our economies, in decommodifying our, um, our productions and so on, to rethink totally our societies in a way of serene democratic transition to our new uh, models of society based on new principles. Um, the, the, the first fast of our book, it's called No is the Time of Monsters. And our book, I think, is quite positive because I see, and it's something I've been fighting for, uh, trying to, to make visible. And I often say that when you speak about degrowth, it's very often also to make visible the invisible in this dominant model of society. I see a lot of invisibilized, uh, very positive things happening in the society. There are a lot of converging surveys showing that we have good reason to, uh, uh, to be positive, to be enthusiastic, to, uh, to, to, uh, implement radical transformation to one toward degrowth so a large majority of uh, people in western europe based on a lot of surveys are more following the degrowth principle and so on but the monsters are here and we don't know how to transform this cultural dynamics into a political 
radical transformation of the society. And that's a bit the conclusion. And, and what Degros has to address to that, and I would say it's also maybe we'll, what will be tonight in the center of the, of the debate. And, uh, and, um, and uh, the main goal of the book is not to provide answer to everything, but to do what I think is the main power of degrowth. And what I always loved in degrowth is to connect the dots and to connect the dots between a lot of movements, a lot of people, a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, intellectual traditions, uh, to connect it also with what already happened in the past. A lot of debates that we have in degrowth already happened in, in the 19th century with uh, Utopian socialism is anarchy. It's already happened in the 1970s with a lot of other movements and so on. So I think it's very important to not to start again everything from scratch, but on the contrary, to connect the people, connect the history, and to understand better each other and implement debate and dialogue. So the book is um, a type of platform for debate, a type of platform for uh, opening our mindset, decolonizing our imaginaries, and co construct uh, new utopias. And to conclude, I will give the word to Anitra, who is not here tonight, with her limerick. Uh, she sent it by email, and she sent the greetings to everybody. Unfortunately, she, she's now making in Australia um, a podcast recording also about the book, which was also important. So it cannot be everywhere, which shows that degrowth is quite in the center of the interest of more and more people. Uh, so Anitra's words. To start the debate, be convivial. Then throw something in that is trivial. Your opponent will fall, and you will look so tall while the audience is left quite oblivious. So thank you very much. Excellent, uh, Vasa and Anitra, who wrote the poem. Thanks so much, um, Vasa, for your presentation. And um, we'll now move to the third and last book that we're going to talk about tonight, which is Degrowth and Movements, Exploring Pathways for Transformation, which is, oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> We've got two of them, uh, which is an anthology edited by Corinna Burkhardt, Matthias Schmelzer, and Nina Troy. And uh, we're lucky to have both Nina and Matthias here tonight. Welcome, Nina. Welcome, Matthias. Um, Nina is a coordinator, facilitator, and networker, as well as co-founder of the Laboratory for New Economic Ideas, the Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie in Leipzig. Um, and Matthias is an economic historian, networker, and climate activist based at the Friedrich Schiller University in Vienna. Um, their book is kind of the first of its kind, really, and uh, has received lots of praise. For example, um, by the prominent degrowth scholar, Jorgos Kallis, who said, moving beyond the growth economy needs a movement of movements. This is an excellent book, establishing a much needed dialogue between the different groups struggling for a good life for all within planetary boundaries. So we're very excited um, for Nina and Matthias to share these insights from those much needed dialogues with us tonight. Nina, Matthias, over to you, please. Thank you very much for being able to be here and for the invitation to the organization. You were already praised for that. And um, I will share my screen and a couple of slides with you. I think this should be working. Um, yeah, our book um, is a compilation of essays by different social movements. And um, while going through the context and the content of the book, we also present the movements, um, starting out <laughs> in alphabetical order with King's M, so 15M, the big uh, squats and occupation of the plazas in Spain and artivism. The background of the book was um, that we are was already raised by the others that degrowth is not only the label of an academic debate, but it's also an emerging social movement. And we have the impression that there is many commonalities, but also differences with other social movements, and there's a lot of space for learning. And in the degrowth conference in 2014, um, we had a lot of different movements present. There was a sociological study who found out that um, I think over 50 movements were present. And people said, OK, I'm a climate activist. Uh, I'm an animal rights activist. I come from a union. And we would like to find out how do you refer to degrowth? And what, what is your connection to this topic and to other social movements? Um, so the project behind degrowth and movements is actually not only a publication project, but also a networking movement between the, those 32 social movements. And we were, we were compilating texts which were published online. We also produced readers and podcasts. The book was already released in German in 2017 and now in English in 2020. I also wrote the two books 
here so that you can have you can both of them. Um, so some obviously movements also change and maybe um, an essay which was written four years ago, it would not be exactly the same right now, but we asked very basic questions and that's why we think it's still worth uh, getting to know those movements now because in principle, probably most of them did not change. And the ones we presented were part of the left and green and social mosaic. So obviously we tried to make a selection of movements that were connected to degrowth, that were interested to degrowth. We had an open process with the other people involved asking, who do you want to integrate further? Obviously there's many movements missing. It was not at all an attempt to be complete or anything. Here you can show the basic um, income movement and when we here. We asked five questions that those um, authors answered. The first one was the key idea of your movement. The second, who is part of the social movements? What do they do? Third, how do you see the relationship between your social movement and degrowth and the relationship with other movements? Which proposals does your movement have for the degrowth perspective? And a space for vision, suggestions, or wishes? Care revolution and the climate justice movement were also part. Here's an overview. Um, in the book, there is an intro by Donatella de la Porta and Barbara Maraca, and there is an added chapter by Eric Pinot on the growth paradigm in capitalism. And you can see an overview from Peter Emma and Chelsea Bourbon Gardening, who was uh, participating. We did not have the opportunity to publish all of the 32 movements in the English book due to um, size limits and financial <laughs> limits on the translation. But we took those who we thought would speak most to the international context. Uh, Commons is also part, and obviously degrowth is part of degrowth movements. Um, I would like to point out the commonalities, the difference, and what we've learned from each other. The commonalities, first one is that the movements shared um, the analysis that we need an economy that serves needs and not profits or work. We see humans not as a homo economicus who makes only rational choices, but that humans are complex relational beings. We, the movements all shared a rather comprehensive analysis. So there was no movement in there who said, okay, we are only limiting ourselves to this and that, but who looked at the wider world in a wider and to wider dynamics. In, on a meta perspective, all of the movements strive for global justice. I'll point out to that later. In practice, this is different, but in overall, they all refer to global justice. There is a certain rejection of the green economy that all those movements share. It's not on the same level, so some of them are more open to it, but um, there is a general understanding that we would not solve the problems that we all have just by greening the economy. They all call for democratization of different um, aspects of life and society. And as mentioned largely by the other three speakers, they call for a paradigm shift. So it's not only about a few reforms or about a different economy, but it's about a, a big cultural shift. Interestingly, without us proposing that so much, um, most of the movements refer to a social and ecological transformation at their point that they have in common. And they all share the need to intervene here and now. So they don't delay their work only in the future, but they say we have to start changing things here. Uh, the demonetized movement also contributed and the eco-villages. The differences that we found between those movements were, first of all, their moral frame of reference. This is a little less strong in the English book because the text on animal rights is not in here. But in general, um, some of them refer to the, be the, be the well-being of humans and some of them of all living beings. And we also had some quite some controversies in there, as you can imagine. The relationship to capitalism is very different. So all of them refer to capitalism as an analytic framework and realize uh, how bad capitalism is, but not all of them are anti-capitalistic and even some of them are not. And that also were, were point of debate. Those movements have very different transformation strategies, which is probably obvious, but also something to really acknowledge. So if you share a desk with, human, uh, with unions, 
and nature conservation associations and refugee movements and urban gardening, they have very different strategies on how to put their transformation into place. And it will need a lot of debates to come together to develop common transformation strategies. The way the movements criticize power and domination are very different. So some of them we say we need to construct a whole different system of power and domination of our social organization. And some of them just fit into the system as it is, let's say. And um, there were, was a big difference in the openness for alliances, which meant that some of them said only if the potential allies share all of our values and our strategies, we can be allies. The others said, well, we have to, big, uh, to construct very big movements. So let's look for the smallest common denominator. Obviously, there's a big difference in the organization. Um, professional hierarchized bodies to very loose networks. The, work around the globe. Um, here you can see the food sovereignty movement and the free software movement. We received some very interesting comments on degrowth, some of them Giacomo and Vincent already presented, which were, the first of all, it's maybe very much of a German debate, is if degrowth equals sufficiency. So the post-growth debate in Germany is very strong on sufficiency, and so many people said, actually, before I knew you, Degrowth for me meant sufficiency. We had a lot of debates on how much more it meant and how much more we want of a transformation. As Vincent said, from an individual to much more dif different levels and working on different levels. The other aspect is something that Vincent pointed out in the beginning saying, well, if you want to um, have a new system which is not based on growth, why do we call it degrowth? It's so much you're focusing on growth while you want to overcome growth. The third one is that we were actually using the term degrowth, so not the translation, which would be something else or postwachstum, but the term degrowth in German. And it's an English word. This means it's very academic. It's an English word that is not very easily understandable, that no one can pronounce in Germany. And so people were saying this term is just not right for what you want to say. You need to find something different. And I think. This is part of the overall de debate we always have on degrowth, but it's also very specific in the German context with the word degrowth, because it's even harder to understand. Some said that they find a different, um, a difficult priority setting in degrowth. They say the degrowth debate is much more academic than they wanted it to be. The example was that climate justice activists often um, get inquiries if they want to be part of an interview um, for a bachelor's thesis, for example, on degrowth, instead of um, people proposing to come to the action with them, they're saying, where is the action? Please focus less on academics. Um, the movements in here are quite different in their relationship to degrowth. So some of them would say, we are part of the degrowth movement, while others say, well, this is the first time we heard about degrowth, so we resemble different movements with a different level of understanding and connectedness to degrowth. Um, here are two examples again, that's the uh, Makers Movement and People's Global Action, which was an anti-globalization movement, mainly active in the 2000s. And we identified many points where we could learn from each other. Obviously, we should need more time to um, go there in depth, but as a short impression. The first one was said that many said degrowth for us is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to speak about the economy and it's, about, it's an opportunity to speak about the big picture and not only think about the struggles that we are in. So they were happy to participate in this project and also to get to know the degrowth better. The second one was that there were very different relationships to the global south. So are we really striving for global justice in the daily work that we do? Or do we mainly have this as an analytical category, but it's not something that's main important in our work. And people said, if you really want to create a strong movement to overcome the actual system, we have to have a new relationship to the global south. And um, obviously in analytical terms, in terms of global settings, but also in our own action. And um, people said that they could learn that other movements were more resistant in more critique of power and domination, more critical of power and domination, and that they could learn from those. Because actually, being um, a very resistant activist or a group that puts power and domination into their center is not something that just happens, right? It's a 
process of learning and of willingness and of processes that you define as a priority and they learn from others on how they could do this. Um, the text that set nature in a different frame, so above all extractivism when we via an animal rights, rights made others think about nature in a different way. And um, there was a strong call to create material spaces. I mean, right now in COVID, I think we all know how important material spaces are and we've learned how much we miss them. But I think there's movements who make a priority of that and others who say, well, this happens on the side. For example, the, the makers movement, they say we need those spaces of the urban gardening movement where people come and it's not even so much about what they do there exactly. It's more about meeting, thinking, discussing and politicizing. Um, one important point was also we asked who is part of the movement and overall um, there's a strong um, a majority of people who come from a white middle class urban background in all of those movements and so all of them said we would like to come overcome milieu boundaries and how do we do that and who could we learn from and obviously there were unions in there there were people from the food sovereignty movement from the refugees movement who are better at that and overcoming these and they could share um, what they had with the others. And there was a strong call for founding alliances and that's also interesting referring to what you said earlier. I think most of the authors would agree that it's not degrowth, which is the movement for movement. Um, yeah, Matthias will speak a little bit about that, about why not, but in, but everyone said we need to have stronger and powerful movements and we would like to be part of that. And with that, I pass it on to Matthias. Okay, um, hello everyone. Good evening also from my side. Um, I actually wanted to um, do a short um, kind of reflection on what this means for a post COVID world. Um, but since the time is already up, I will uh, leave this for the discussion. Um, here you can see the three points that um, we intended to talk about, um, but I think it's great to um, leave this for later, just to be fair in terms of time. Um, and I move directly to the limerick, um, which actually our co-editor Corinna Burkhardt sent to us. Um, she actually sent eight different limericks. So maybe we'll also post some of the other ones later in the YouTube channel for the competition. But this one we really liked. Leave us alone with your growth machine. Forget your capitalist regime. Socio-ecological disaster, only to be faster. We have a much better dream. So I will leave it with this um, and look forward to the debate. I'm so sorry, Matthias, for taking up so much time. I couldn't see any watch anymore. <laughs> Right. Thanks so much, uh, Nina and Matthias, uh, for an excellent presentation and an excellent uh, limerick. Um, well, that is actually partly thanks to uh, Corinna. Um, in this uh, instance, a little reminder that if you're watching this at home and you want to be part of the limerick contest, which we very much encourage you to, please um, chip in with your own with your own limerick and put it in the YouTube chat, and we'll put it up for voting in the end. Um, and speaking of chipping in, another reminder that um, please, if you can, uh, help us with our fundraise, with our crowdsourcing um, campaign, as it really helps us to sustain these talks. Okay, um, we'll now move to the kind of main point of the evening in a, in a way, which is the debate. Um, and we'll do this in two parts. We'll first um, ask a few questions that we've prepared with the Degos Talks team, and then we'll take questions from the audience. So um, please continue typing your questions into the YouTube chat um, if you have any, and we'll, we'll um, put them up for discussion uh, in the next slot. Okay, so um, first question, and um, this is gonna be um, directed firstly to Nina. So um, yeah, get ready. And it's a tricky, it's a tricky one, okay? <laughs> I, I, I can already say that. So, um, 2020 has really been a crazy year in many ways, right? With a lot of suffering, with a lot of unprecedented events, starting with the unprecedented wildfires in Australia first and in California with COVID-19, obviously, and all the crisis that came with it, with the murder of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests 
with the US elections. And amidst all of this, um, also an increasing interest in degrowth, um, perhaps not least related to all of these events. So can you explain some of these events through a degrowth lens? And, and, and do you think we're reaching a sort of tipping point? I think Matthias should answer this. This time, are you more prepared? And I've been talking for like 10 minutes. OK, Matthias, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so this is a very difficult question. Um, and I think degrowth may partly explain these, but I think degrowth is um, not developed as a theory to kind of like explain, explain all these different crises. But I think what we can see is um, that through the uh, continu continu continuous expansion of the growth economy, we experience um, what uh, scholar Andreas Malm has described as a global sickening. Um, and I think this is an interesting term to kind of like understand what is happening in terms of um, the results of biodiversity loss, um, the increasing encroachment of industrial agriculture into areas where there used uh, to be less of it, um, in terms of how this creates kind of like new forms of um, sicknesses. COVID-19 being in, um, the, the most important case right now, but I think this, this might be a more general trend. Then obviously climate change is a key result of the growth economy. And from all we know, um, the climate emergency cannot be addressed without also addressing this challenge of economic growth, the dependency of our economies on economic growth. So I think here's a key, a key explanation kind of like binding these together. Um, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, I hesitate a bit because I think there's great theories coming from um, black scholars that are not part of the degrowth debate explaining um, the racial injustices in the context, uh, in the global context, in particular in the US context. So I would be a bit wary also because I think um, for the degrowth movement we have so far um, not a well-developed kind of like a self-critical um, analysis of our kind of like rather privileged position um, as scholars um, in the degrowth conferences, etc., and also in linking up to the actual struggles on the ground around um, racism, refugees, etc., etc. There's also an amazing, amazing chapter which I recommend you to read in our book on this question, um, and there you see kind of like some of the tensions that can come up um, from this. Um, the work that needs to be done from the degrowth perspective of actually engaging in the struggles on the ground. And I leave it with this. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Matthias. Susan, do you have anything to add to that sort of 2020 recap? No, okay, that's great. Um, then we'll move straight to the next question. Um, I'll start with Vassa. Um, so it's sort of like the flip side of maybe more attention uh, for degrowth in the last year is also that degrowth has received a fair bit of critique, um, probably not all of it engaging seriously with degrowth in a way, but you know, often quite sort of mis misportraying degrowth actually in a way, and then dismissing it kind of on that basis. So um, what's going on there? Um, is that misunderstanding? Is it irreconcilable antagonism? Is it the famous first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win? Or how do you make sense of that? So we've just, uh, we've just published an article in French, fortunately, for a very good Swiss uh, degrowth uh, journal called uh, Less, Moins. And um, it's exactly the question they ask us to, to reflect on, because it's always coming back in the degrowth network. And, and, um, and, and we focus on the fact that actually when, and you can really see it nowadays, the way we attacked. Um, when we started with degrowth, uh, very soon we say that uh, we are attacking a type of very deep belief, a type of religion. And it's very difficult to uh, fight against a religion or belief with uh, rational argumentations. And um, we take this example, like the new prime minister in France, uh, Jean Castex, when he made his uh, inauguration speech at the Assemblée Nationale, uh, he started like that. He said, I believe in ecological growth and I don't believe in... Uh, I believe in green growth, and I don't believe in ecological degrowth. And he didn't say that uh, we worked with our team of experts, scientists, 
politicians and say that based on our analysis, um, green growth is desirable and uh, ecological uh, degrowth is wrong. He said that I believe. And, uh, and very often when you see the type of articles which are attacking us, they are not attacking degrowth for what degrowth is uh, speaking about, but what they fear when we start to question degrowth, what are the projection uh, toward degrowth. And that's why the words like uh, decolonization of your imaginary, um, cultural transformation of society uh, are, are really what is degrowth about. And it's really about uh, also to quote Serge Latouche, or Paul Arias, maybe it was, he said that we are like uh, junkies. And our main drug is, uh, uh, is economic growth, with what is everything which is behind, like innovation, development, uh, domination, on minority dominating a majority, all dominating the nature, et cetera, et cetera. And what we need is a type of therapy, like uh, junkies, to go out of our uh, dr drug addictions. And uh, somehow it takes time, but uh, there are a lot of uh, very interesting signs, again, and surveys showing that uh, um, more and more people are more following the degrowth uh, principles. And if I may also reflect on the former question where COVID-19, there is no explanation from degrowth how we ended up with that, but COVID-19 revealed a lot of problems our societies face, what degrowth was always uh, speaking about, like uh, our economic model with a long, very complex um, uh, supply chains and so on. And through COVID-19, people started to understand that the system, which looks like so powerful, is actually incredibly weak. As soon as a small problem, because we are quite lucky with COVID is a tragedy, but it's not the worst pandemics we, we, we could get, and, and maybe not the worst we may get again. Um, but how uh, it totally destabilized our economies, our political system, and so on. And also, the, to be pushed to be locked down, push the people to focus on what is degrowth question to what really matters and what is a meaningful life and not to run on after uh, more and more and to go to your bushy job to, to get more, to produce more, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Vincent. Um, we'll move on to the next question. This one is for Susan first. You touched a little bit upon this in your presentation, but I'd like to go a bit deeper maybe, and this is probably where some of the juice of this discussion will sit. So um, Susan, what's your theory of change? And in particular, that's gonna be the really tricky one. What's your theory of how degrowth becomes reality? All right, so what are the steps we need? What are the biggest challenges to overcome? Um, and maybe is it sort of, is it, more about the what in terms of like the what policies and the and what institutions and what alternatives that we need to figure out or is the problem mainly the how to get there susan please wow strategies for change <laughs> all right well i'm very lucky because um i'm particularly interested in changing the way we produce humans the way we produce and reproduce thinking humans through neuroplasticity and muscle memory. And I'm a teacher. So every day I get to go in and work with a lot of graduate students and help provoke dialogues that maybe make them become human in different ways or invite them to become human in different ways. That's one of the many ways um, for a theory of change. But what I've just been thinking during this conversation is which of these books am I gonna have Am I going to read first in my next class? Right? <laughs> because one of the ways to change is to get a more sophisticated awareness and critique of what's been going on in the past. And there we read Vincent and Amitra that do a wonderful job of sort of intellectual genealogy and also the kind of political struggles in making a movement of degrowth and also the tools. Vincent, I mean, you beautifully conceptualize a bunch of sort of key tools that I want my young people to think with, right? I mean, I want them to go and make change in the world in those tools. But not only that, what I love is you got each word like mm, decoupling, John's paragraph, whatever. But then you talk about how the, even the definition and application of those is a power struggle, right? And which is exactly what, right. And the other thing that I've already been doing in class is having students read those cases. The concept work people, you're great. I love that you put them online, you made them available. And so we, you know, students pick different ones from your website and sort of compare and contrast. And 
think about their own lives and their own movements in relation in dialogue with real empirical cases of other struggling humans that are moving, right? And so for me, that's another piece of change is seeing your own personal path in situ and seeing other human paths and, and learning by walking together and stumbling together, which is another beautiful thing about these cases, right? So um, that's changed from my perspective. I know other people have different dimensions going on, but you've all already helped me advance in my own little path towards change. So thank you. Many thanks, uh, Susan. And um, Nina, I'd also like to ask you to speak to this question. Uh, you've also been involved in the Degoth Strategies Conference in, in Vienna. And also you, um, I think, are one of the authors of this new book um, or booklet, um, Future for All. So what, what are your thoughts, Nina? Okay, I shouldn't take too much credit since Matthias here is where we're four authors. Um, so what I thought is last time Jacqueline Vincent, Matthias and I met in person was 2018 in Malmö. And we had a discussion about the state. Um, should we ignore it? Should we overcome it? Should we reform it? And that was also a very big debate that was there in the audience at night, um, which will, can be summarized probably as a clash of anarchists versus communists. And I think the first thing I would like to say is that I don't believe in the one big strategy, that, but I think we all need to come together and we need to see the good parts about different strategies. And that we need um, radical reforms that try to put things better in the system we now have. Um, we were talking about the Unconditional Autonomy Alliance, about renewable energies, about better um, health systems, things like that, um, a, a reduction of working time. But we also need strategies where people actually can act. So where individuals change their lives, build up new structures, solidarity, common structures, where they take back infrastructures, where they organize themselves in a decommodified way. But all those won't work if we don't do something with the power which is now there in the price part of a capitalist regime in, in big companies and the, and the system, let's say, and um, in our democratic, democratic system. So I think we, we won't get there if we just say, well, say we leave it aside. So in the end, I think we also need um, uh, a theory or a way we transform uh, power relations in our society. And as Susan just said, I think we always hope that we can do this by design, right? We wouldn't want to change into a caring society by design, not by disaster. But I think what COVID has shown us is that there's going to be a lot of disasters coming. Um, if we had belief in it earlier, we saw it now at least. And that we will need to make take the chances of those crises to come and we won't be able to design them in our little corner and say hey now we put them forward so we need to be able to react and i think that and then, then leads us back that degrowth must be something that speaks to people who do action and movement so we need something that as a degrowth idea that speaks to unions and people and black lives matter and people who are like radical climate activists and not something that we develop but that people take out to the street Many thanks, uh, Nina and Susan, again. Um, Giacomo, Giacomo, the next question is for you. Um, it kind of speaks to a particular aspect of change, I guess. So um, degrowth aspires to a really fundamental transformation of our political, econo economic, and social systems. Um, and many argue that fundamental change takes time. At the same time, we're in a climate and ecological emergency, and we kind of need to slash our emissions and environmental impacts within a matter of years to prevent probably catastrophic changes. So how do you reconcile the need for rapid change and the need for fundamental change? Thank you, Jeffrey. Well, I think the, this, uh, this question relates a little bit with the with was uh, discussed uh, in in the previous in the previous uh, issue. I think that the point is that uh, sometimes there is a great focus on the on the change at a personal level. But uh, what we have uh, tried to to all say this this night, I think, uh, to stress once again that the change is an articulation between the personal, the communal, and the political. So we need to be able to mobilize. Uh, alliances that are able to uh, complement these different changes happening at different levels. 
okay? Um, th this is very important uh, um, in order to understand uh, also the, the, the relation between the slowness of our, let's say, even rhetoric of the growth and uh, the rapidness of uh, the change that we want to uh, see implemented, no? I think uh, uh, sometimes we then uh, forgot even our experience, no? Uh, we, for example, uh, give spaces to Greta Thunberg in our, in our uh, book uh, that a very simple, slow um, Friday um, of the school create a huge moment that really was a, 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 an important leverage for a massive movement emerge in very uh, small time, let's say. So uh, the important thing is that we have to understand that the articulation, that all the preparedness that we are able to show through our changes on the ground are creating common senses that are um, immediately, sometimes, showing up in, a, in, um, in the aftermath of some events that we didn't expect. So I think it's not a matter, you know, to be prepared uh, for the moment and to take the chance of the uh, huge event and then, you know, rapidly we, we make the changes. Uh, there is not, you know, it is a univocal uh, thought about how the change can happen. I think it's uh, uh, it's um, a matter of uh, uh, um, of chance, of course, but it's a matter of the capacity of creating different. Uh, we say in our book, for example, different common senses, no, uh, and the fact that we are able through our activity on the grounds to create. Uh, different common senses that will emerge massively uh, um, after uh, some events, no? And this is, of course, now we have re to reflect uh, on, on this aspect uh, of the pandemic a little bit. I think the first wave, uh, above all in, in Europe, um, created in most of us uh, a sort of enthusiastic um, uh, interpretation of... Um, different groups that self-organize to care for our neighborhoods, to care for uh, our vulnerable people and so on and so far. Uh, and now in this second wave, we see our unpreparedness, I would say. Somehow the, the, the political government and the, the emergency power are taking over uh, on our ability as community to uh, create uh, responses that are not in line to the normal that want to be reestablished, as Susan was saying at the beginning. No, that that's that's uh, sh that should be our main concern in this moment. No, our main concern is how we now, as community working on the grounds on in different contexts, be able to strategize to give a new response. Uh, that imagine the first wave of the COVID, but is now too much silent, I will say. Uh, above all, again, uh, uh, speaking from uh, a Europe uh, kind of experience. And this is uh, the real tragic uh, situation in which we are, uh, because I think the, the idea of uh, solidarity, the, the idea of sharing and taking care for the vulnerable, vulnerable people from the ground is now uh, slowly uh, disappearing from even the political debates. As Susan uh, was saying at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, for example, in Spain, immediately after the, the first wave, they were uh, discussing about um, a basic income or a care income too, and so on and so far. But now everything is forgotten about it. You know, they, they talked about what is called a vital salary, a minimum salary in Spain that arrived to a very few people, not all the massive of people that are losing their job, they are losing their hope and so on and so far. So I, I, I think that the, the problem of changing at the moment uh, should push to us to reflect on now we can relaunch our ability uh, from the ground to uh, rethink a different responses to the pandemic. 
Many thanks, uh, Giacomo, and, and and thanks that you pointed out to to this kind of being, I guess, uh, limited to European um, and Anglo-Saxon perspective here. So let's take a moment to to recognize who's not in the room, which is um, really important, I guess, in particular when we speak about sort of weighing up different um, challenges or different aspects of the struggle. Thanks. Um, Matthias, quick question for you um, as a historian. Um, Churchill once said, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? So crisis, I guess, opens up um, a window of opportunity for change. And uh, many say that the sort of progressive left um, did let the 2008-2009 crisis go to waste. And now we're in the middle of an even greater crisis. Are we letting this one go to waste as well? Or are we actually observing big changes? Um, is, is it happening? Yeah, thank you very much, um, Jeffen. I think this also relates a bit to the last question because I think um, this crisis showed, um, or kind of like the, if we look back at the last decades, we can see that the, the likelihood of the changes that we envision and that we need, for example, for climate justice to become reality, the magnitude of these changes is very unlikely in the step-by-step -step mode of doing politics that we normally do. Um, and that most likely, if, if it's going to happen, it will have to do something with the crisis produced by the system itself, produced by, by the capitalist economy. Um, however, um, as you pointed out, the, the left social movements um, have not been well prepared in kind of like taking up these crises and shaping them to our advantage. Um, and I think while there have been many discussions after 2007, 2008 about how to kind of like build alliances better, how to be in a better situation when the crisis comes, we were by and large not prepared for the form the crisis took in this case, in the COVID-19 case, um, which also kind of like took away, took away a lot of the um, kind of like organizing capabilities, we need to build up pressure. And I think this is the great dilemma of the current situation. It's basically impossible to responsibly organize large scale action speed demonstrations or actions of civil disobedience in a situation of a pandemic. Um, but without these, all we do is just talk. Uh, maybe there's a bit of kind of like shifting of dis discourses, but we do, we do not get to the centers of power and we cannot really leverage um, this power that we, uh, that should, act that actually needs to, needs to happen. And I think it's um, like, what, what we see now is that um, this situation of the pandemic is actually, and this is particular, particularly so in, in Germany, but also in other, other places like the US, that it increases the power of those forces that do not take the pandemic seriously to organize on the streets and push for political projects that are even worse than the current situation. And I think um, this is one key challenge and I would look um, forward to um, answers from the other people in the room um, for how we can actually deal with this because I'm quite, um, quite um, I, I don't see perspective very often um, when I look at the situation in this way. Yeah, who in the room wants, yes, yeah, Susan, please go ahead. Great, this is a, such a urgent discussion. I, I, I just, I know we all learned so much from Gramsci who taught us that it's really hard to think or act counter hegemonically. Even our word degrowth, we're already repeating growth at the center of everything, right? But he also said, when things get really screwed up and mayhem and chaotic, that's a moment when sometimes a light comes through. And one of my favorite heroes um, made a song recently, Leonard Cohen, where the chorus says, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So maybe, <laughs> maybe we see that light coming in and we can thrive and push in this moment. So I hope that gives us motivation. Beautiful. Uh, thanks so much, Susan. And with that, I'll go over to Lena, who will um, present the questions from the audience. So first of all, 
Thank you very much for this very nice uh, discussion so far. Um, I just want to give a quick reminder that uh, we are now closing for the Limerick proposal um, and that uh, the audience, you can now vote for your favorite. Um, Kat will post the link to the Google Forms where you can place your vote in the YouTube chat. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, imagine winning the first ever Degrowth book debate poetry slam. That would be quite a cool thing to, uh, to remember. <laughs> anyway, okay. So um, while you have been discussing and presenting your books, there has also been going quite a good discussion in the YouTube chat. Um, for example, several people are discussing about macroeconomics, ecological money, monetary theory, basic income, and also more fundamental questions like the need to overcome capitalism or not, and the assumption that growth has delivered also massive human improvements like progress and increasing life expectancy and ending hunger and so on. So, it's just interesting also to reflect on this and then uh, we will we have chosen a couple of questions only because we are already running a little bit close on time so the first one um uh, that we would like to ask um and we are directing this one to you vincent which is um what about non-western concepts and practices of when we read and ubuntu um the question is why do we need this new French introduced concept as um, degrowth? So of course you don't need this new French uh, anything. I mean, it's rather better to stay far away from France when you see how things are going on there in these days and when you look at our barbarian history and, and so on. But on the contrary, the one making the biggest mistake can also uh, learn something to the one who still haven't made these mistakes. and. Uh, and it's not by chance um, that uh, degrowth was really the meeting to uh, the group of people I presented in my introduction. We invented this word decroissance, who are more like adbusters and activists. Uh, they met with a group of more like intellectuals or so academics uh, coming from global south and global north um, and working together on radical critiques to development. And I would say that one of the funding uh, in event of degrowth was really this conference at UNESCO in 2002, uh, which happened in the same time of the first publication in French about degrowth with the same people. And uh, the title of that conference at UNESCO was Deconstruct Development, Rebuild the World. And I would say uh, that degrowth is really an invitation to uh, go out of our uh, narrow minded Western approach of uh, development, of the society based on the imperialistic tool. Of development and uh, go through a very interesting journey in global south, in other, uh, in other uh, civilization and so on. And uh, it's not by chance that we use this expression in French, decolonization of your imaginary. So it's really related to uh, our tradition for colonization and behind colonization was this strong imperialistic uh, approach to educate the world, to uh, bring civilization to the world. So it's how to move out of this narrative and, and um, this imperialism. And, um, and parallel to that imaginary, it's also the mindset what you have behind. And I will totally refer to a, a book written in French by uh, a wonderful woman who's an alter-globalist activist and politician, and also, uh, I think, uh, artist. Um, and her name is Animata Traoré. Uh, she used to be the, the minister of... Uh, of culture in Mali. And she wrote a book uh, about the uh, history of colonization, which is called The Rape of the Imaginary. And the degrowth is really to understand that yeah, behind growth narrative, behind development, behind all this uh, slogan coming from the West, there is a type of rape of all, all our imaginaries. And together, we should implement dialogue to uh, decolonize these I mean, imaginaries and to be free to start to think in another way and to construct new worlds. Great, thank you. Um, would any of you like to follow up on, on this uh, answer? Otherwise, I will move to the next uh, question. It was quite a complete answer, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I, I would like to say something about capitalism. 
if it's possible. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's something that I think we, we, we all share because we are all experiencing is the fact that in this uh, pandemic time, one of the aspects that is very central to the capitalist force is the inequality. And what we are experiencing nowadays is an extraordinary, unacceptable increase of inequality worldwide. Uh, and inside nation, across nation. And this is an issue that is related to the capitalist logic of the machine that can work in capitali uh, uh, as a capitalist force, even in recession. And, and now we are, uh, I think, uh, we are well aware that uh, the capitalist system as a whole, uh, we have seen and we have said also this many times no the, the, the capitalist forces are um, related to a logical or you uh, growth or you die but i think uh, the way in which now we are experiencing capitalist forces is that uh, it's like uh, we grow i mean the elites and you die and this is something that we should absolutely avoid we cannot accept that the capitalist forces will create uh, what um, somehow Matthias was uh, underlining it a bit, no? A, a, a political nightmare of uh, emergenciocracy, of uh, eco-fascist, uh, but run by the dynamic forces of capital. So I think it's, uh, it's pretty clear, it should be pretty clear that uh, there is no uh, a way forward for a degrowth society uh, where the engine uh, of economic machine is uh, capitalist. So I think this is my reaction to the question of uh, uh, capital issue that was raised, I think, uh, in YouTube discussion. I just have a, a very quick response to one of the great questions that Lena read from the participants who said, well, but what about growth has done such a good job of improving life on earth? We're now wealthier, healthier, longevity on average. Totally true on average. But as Giacomo says, the inequalities are extraordinary. No, never in the history of the world were there such enormous differences in health, wealth, Half the, half the wealth in the world is now owned by 26 people, right? It's just extreme. And so th there's a different way to look at that same question. Yes, growth has increased the total, the absolute and the total and the average wealth, but it's also created unprecedented misery, suffering and sacrifice for many of our fellow humans at the same time. Thank you, Susan and Giacomo. Um, Vincent, did you want to uh, give a comment? I always want to give comment, but I already speak on uh, All right, great. Well, then I will move on to the, the next question, which actually follows on quite well from what you were saying, uh, Giacomo. Um, and that is, are there any comprehensive economic theories emerging or being developed about how a degrowth economy could work and how it would work differently to our existing economies. So should degrowth situate itself as a reject rejection to neoliberalism, for example? So um, maybe Matthias, you want to, to give your take on this? Sure, thanks. Um, I think by now we can say that there is a lot of, diff like a, a large variety of um, accounts of how a degrowth economy would look like. Um, there's a lot of overlap in the different um, kind of like visions that are presented there with uh, similar kind of like sets of core policies. And I think um, the degrowth community has done a lot um, in the recent years in kind of like trying to um, flesh out these various policy proposals that underlie a degrowth vision um, and discussing the coherence of these visions. Um, and I would also uh, support what has been said on the issue of capitalism. Um, so degrowth should not be framed as just a rejection of neoliberalism, which is obviously also is. Um, and I think there's a lot 
one can kind of like take out of in how is degrowth reacting to neoliberalism also why did degrowth become so prominent at the kind of like um, peak of the neoliberal era um, but I think more fundamentally degrowth is a rejection of, um, of capitalism and this is increasingly becoming a kind of like common sense, common sense within the degrowth community. Um, I do feel that there is still a lot to discuss what this actually means. What do we mean by capitalism and in how far is a post, uh, is, is degrowth actually a post capitalist economy? Um, so there's a, a lot to discuss in this regard, but at least um, there is kind of like an emerging consensus that uh, the power of private corporations and the market should be kind of like put back and that market based solutions also to the climate crisis are not ideal. Uh, there's a lot of like kind of like criti critical debates around these and that in, in fact one should put um, human needs and a care logic at the center of the degrowth economy. And understanding this, with, which is actually one of the kind of like core results of our project degrowth and movements also as a kind of like core consensus from all these different uh, movements coming together. If we put needs and care at the center of thinking about the economy, then this is not really compatible with a kind of like capitalist um, system. Right, thank you. That's very nice. Maybe we can make another degrowth talks about degrowth and capitalism at a later point. Um, so next question. Um, how do we get the degrowth agenda into politics? Should we, for example, create political parties that stand for degrowth? Or should we try to go like, how could we bring existing political parties to endorse degrowth? Do you have any kind of ideas about that? Um, maybe for Nina, maybe you want to answer this? Okay, so first of all, I would say this is a question that the degrowth movement also thinks about and hasn't found the one existing answer yet, because otherwise it would be much more powerful than we are. And I think a lot of us showed that the degrowth thinking and the degrowth agenda, especially with the debate we just had on capitalism, is totally contrary to the existing system. So I think what we could do is we could bring it into party politics and make it um, understandable, make it audible. So to, to show our core issues, that is possible, or to show aspects of it. As I said, for example, referring to revolutionary real politics, saying we would need to have a working time reduction, we would need to reinforce care and health. So we can take steps into the right direction if ever those parties who refer to that are in power. But I don't think that within the system we have um, of parliamentary politics, let's say in Europe, I mean, it's also, we are talking about this at a very global level and we don't have the same <laughs> political system everywhere. I don't think we could implement degrowth because it's so contradictory to the system. And that then refers back to the first question we had, one of the first is, what is our theory of social change? And I think we could go quite a few steps on making the growth bigger and making it work the controversies and take out some of the steps, but would not come to a degrowth society by reforms put into place by the actual sitting parties. Great, thank you. Um, I've just been prompted to maybe quickly ask you, Vincent, if uh, you want to also just share something quickly about this, because um, you maybe have some experience with. Yeah, because so. Yeah, somehow I have a lot of uh, very great uh, devastating experience with uh, politics and I participated in, uh, in the French Degros party in France. I also participated in the construction of a lot of political parties here in Hungary or, or in France and followed several uh, experience and it's um, also what pushed us in France and me particularly to to argue that uh, how to construct the type of transformation of the society without necessarily looking for power I mean without a central strategy of power overtaking because if you take power you're taken by the power which doesn't mean that you abandon it and, and somehow to be tricky to be smart to uh, invent new ways to uh, construct counter power. So you have to resist, you have to make civil disobedience, you have to make a type of a demonstration, typical action to fight against um, the non system, to fight against the oligarchy, to fight against the corporations, etc, etc. 
but also there are a lot of fantastic experimentation which are underway, uh, on which I think we should construct more. The, I will only mention two very quickly. The first one is the municipalist movement. We could see in the last years in a lot of countries all around Europe, all around the world, how uh, on much more local politics, a uh, citizen list, citizen movement could take municipalities or influence politics within municipalities in reinventing much more direct democracy. As uh, a second example, I would uh, I will mention is uh, the French uh, Citizen Convention for the Climate, which was uh, emerging from the yellowest movement and the incredible level of police repression and violence against the demonstrators and so on. So some degrowth friends in France cooperated with the yellowest people and some other people and pushed Macron to implement a type of convention where they randomly chose 150 citizens from all around France and representing uh, the, the diversity of France and so on. And they could work for one year, uh, not meeting so much, only on the weekends, few weekends, uh, to reflect on what could be a policy, uh, what France can do with their political institution to fight against climate change. And it was unbelievable to see that how these randomly chosen people were among them in the beginning, a lot of them didn't hear about climate change or even deny climate change, never heard about degrowth, never heard about the type of topics we speak about tonight and so on. But after one year of deliberation, they and very badly organized and not the best condition and uh, and not so much so much time and so on. They ended up with 150 proposals, which are very close to uh, what we put all of us in our academic papers or article or text or books and so on. And it's a very interesting example that uh, the main goal is not to take power and to tell to the people what to think, but on the contrary, to try to push the society to put on the table the right questions. And if you ask the people the right question, you will end up with the right solutions. And somehow where we face a lot of problems towards that is that we have this oligarchic system where mainstream media are in the end of the oligarchy of the corporation, whose main goal is exactly to do the contrary, not to put on the table the right question, but to uh, uh, take our imaginary to uh, desire things or to focus on things which are not in the center of the interest or not in the center of what we should debate about. Can I say something about the party? Yes, thank you. Then uh, we will have a quick uh, comment from Giacomo and then Susan, and then we have one last question. Well, to be very quick, then the, I, I will say that I'm, uh, I will not oppose to any creation of a party for the growth. So, uh, first of all, even if I still think that the, what is really important is that we are able to make uh, our point in our current discussion. Okay. So, I, I, I think I'm in line with the, the proposal of Vincent to say, Okay, we try to convince uh, people to discuss the proper issue, and this is one of our jobs. For example, in our book, we discuss about Green New Deal without growth. So we uh, try to enter in the discussion about Green New Deal, but trying to explain that if you want to pursue a Green New Deal uh, in, the, in the name of growth, then you are wrong. You, you should try to, to answer to that in different ways. Okay, but on the other side, on the, on the aspect of uh, of the party and the power, uh, again, I think just to complement what uh, what was discussed by Vincent. For example, I am not against the, the power two. I mean, what we are trying to to do is exactly the power to create a new vision of political uh, society. Uh, the problem is the power over. So I will, if there is someone that is think, uh, thinking of creating a party to take the power and use this power over other people, then I will say, no, I oppose to you, even in the name of the growth. Okay. But if you uh, use the power to create a um, new kind of policies to, for example, for example to diminish inequality that we are experiencing, then I will support you, even if your party uh, uh, has not a label uh, in the label degrowth. Okay, so I think it's a, it's a matter of uh, uh, how we articulate our political vision through the existing parties or 
show new party that will emerge, I think, uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic. I had a quick comment that I think my fantasy of degrowth emerging as the vanguard of political future, there's not many people that, that, that see that as possible, but I think it's much more probable that we become part of a movement of movements around social and environmental justice. And that way we can have red, green, rainbow flags all together in a movement. And our question wouldn't be what the writer wrote in was, how do we move degrowth agenda into politics? But how do we actually change the playing field to allow different movements to thrive in synergy with each other? That's a whole sort of different type of strategy. All right, thank you very much. So we just have this one last question now that we would like Nina to uh, answer. And that is, imagine it is 2050 and degrowth is now a reality in the global north. In such a degrowth society, what is life like for a typical member? So first of all, we should think of 2048 because that sounds so much more revolutionary than 2050, but anyways, at the same time. <laughs> so um, our life would be much slower and it would be much more caring and in an interaction with more humans and less with machines. It would be a mass, much less stress and much less worried. We would know that the kind of way life we are living is not on the expense of others and of the um, of nature, but that what we, what, we, what we do is actually okay, even if we take it to you know, really think it through. And we would still be kind of like working, contributing something to society that we think is needed, but it would be much less framed in, uh, I go somewhere, I work there 40 hours a week, I go home, I take privately care of, take care of care <laughs> privately, I have to do my learning on the side. Um, it's more like, it's more fluid, and we have a much better comprehension of what kind of work or job is good for society, it makes us strive, um, strive all of us. Um, yeah, and it's like, it's, it's a, it's a world that we imagine, I mean, at the end, it's about a free society, right? So we would have a world with much less domination, where everybody can contribute and doesn't have to be, uh, having the threat of being discriminated, and people from all over the world can go anywhere they want, and that's not um, people with European passes going everywhere they want, and people with passes from Pakistan can go anywhere. So it's a much more equal world. And that also refers to we've solved all the issues that we've talked about. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Nina. And thanks so much to all our panelists um, for a really great discussion. I would, I would love to continue and to you know, have this discussion more often. But um, we need to come to the end of our evening, but we're not quite at the end. We're actually going to the highlight of the evening in a way. Uh, we're kind of posing the ultimate challenge to our dear um, panelists um, as we're going back to the sphere of arts and creativity and taking it to the next level, because we're gonna jointly write a degrowth poem in just two minutes, and we will do it sort of blindly as well. <laughs> so that sounds maybe like a masterclass in poetry, but don't worry, it's a, uh, uh, we can do this. Each of you will only have to write a few words. Um, so what we're going to do is, is basically a slightly different version of, a, of what's called a sankha. Um, so it's a poem with a specific format. So one example of a sankha is this. Summer, ending softly. Leaves start falling, gathering on the ground, comforting. So the idea being that the first line has one word, the second line has two words, the third line has three words and so forth. Um, now we'll do it slightly different. Um, we'll do it with six lines and um, simultaneously. So um, each of you will get one line um, and you will not know what the line before you is saying basically. You will sort of put your line in the chat and then Lena will put it all together and see what comes out. Um, so and the first line, in this case, we as your hosts are choosing for you and uh, very creatively we're choosing the word degrowth. 
So the first line is degrowth. Um, the second line will be two words, and that's for Vincent, right? Um, don't say anything. Don't and write them in the chat only to, to Lina. Yeah, two words for Vincent, second line. Third line, three words, Matthias. Fourth line, four words, Susan. Fifth line, five words, Nina. And sixth line, last word, last uh, line, one word, Giacomo. Okay, so um, is everyone clear on the instructions? I can put them in the chat as well, but um, you've basically got two minutes roughly now to do this, and then we will put it all together and see this uh, beautiful co-creative poem emerge. Um, while our authors are writing this poem, and before we're getting to the winner of the Limerick contest, or <laughs> what Lena called the poetry slam, um, a few um, reminders for other things that are happening in the degrowth sphere. First of all, um, if you like this debate, if you like what we've previously done, again, a reminder to please support us. We need this to sustain ourselves, to sustain our efforts and spread more degrowth debates, more degrowth talks, more degrowth poetry and so forth. So please um, help us with chipping in even just a little bit in the degrowth crowdfunder that you will find in the chat and in the YouTube information uh, bio. Um, secondly, there's more exciting degrowth things happening very soon because we'll have the Vienna degrowth days um, starting this Friday and then going until Wednesday next week. So um, check that out, the program's out, the registration is open, and there's a lot of interesting sessions speaking specifically about strategy and change. Um, I'm also happy to announce a new project of ours, um, which will start tomorrow, hopefully, fingers crossed, which is a, a degrowth mini video series, probably called Degrowth Small Talks. I'm not sure if we decided a name yet, <laughs> um, which is going to spread very short social media friendly messages of degrowth, uh, speaking to key issues and questions. Um, so watch this space and, and, and share them in whatever social media sphere you operate in. Um, and also when we thought about this, like what could, what could be the next thing for us? What could be the next way to spread degrowth messages and ideas? We realized that there's really hardly any degrowth memes out there. Or we couldn't find any or like very few, very few good ones. So if you're creative, um, if you've got some great sort of I don't know, drawing skills or got good humor or whatever. Um, make some memes, put them out there, tag us in them, and we can we can spread them. We need more degrowth memes to <laughs> transform this world. Um, also, if you got inspired by today's limericks and today's uh, the poem that we're just creating, the Sankar, um, write some of those and, and spread them as well. And finally, um, follow us on our social media platforms for more content on, on degrowth, degrowth talks, degrowth debates, and the videos. Okay, so enough announcements. Now everyone's probably eagerly, ready, eagerly waiting to hear um, the big co-creative degrowth poem. Uh, Lena, how are we doing? So I am still missing one word, actually, from Diaco. So oh. um, I'm not sure if you are ready or if we should maybe I, announce the limerick uh, first. I, I, I wrote to you your, my, my word. Oh, dear. I'm so sorry. Maybe you can send it again? Right. He sent it to me accidentally, but I sent okay, it to you perfect. now. Perfect. <laughs> now we are ready. All right. So degrowth. Convival syrup, movement of movements, rhythm synced and syncopated, love and care, no despair, home. <laughs> very nice. I think this is a very great first attempt at the completely blind poetry slam. <laughs> so, will you read it one more time, Lena? Yes, of course. So the word is degrowth, convival syrup, movement of movements, rhythm synced and syncopated, love and care, no despair, home. Great job. Wow. <laughs> All right. So you seem very curious now to hear about the Limerick uh, winner since we had such a great uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do have a winner. We've uh, we've had a total of ten limericks sent in, 
um, which is amazing. Thank you so much for everyone who, could, who um, sent in their limericks. Thanks again so much to our panelists for not only participating, but also sending in their, uh, or like also writing their limericks today. Um, but our winner is actually someone who's in the audience and it's uh, Sam Bliss, um, who won with quite a large margin of votes. Uh, <laughs> um, and the limerick goes as follows. When it comes to the planet and growth, it's clear that we cannot have both. So what do we do once we've already outgrew the Earth system's boundaries degrowth? <laughs> Should I read it once again or did everyone? Yeah. Go Sam! Yeah. <laughs> okay, so once again, when it comes to the planet and growth, it's clear that we cannot have both. So what do we do once we've already outgrew the Earth system's boundaries degrowth. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Sam Bliss. The, you're the winner of the first degrowth poetry slam. And um, if you're happy for, for, for it, um, we'll spread it on all our channels. Um, and yeah, and everyone shall read it. Okay, um, I think we're coming to the end of this. The very last thing to say is just a lot of thank you. So thank you so much for our, to our panelists uh, for coming, taking the time, um, really great presentations, really great debate, uh, really great limericks as well. Uh, and, and to your co-authors who, who wrote uh, some of the limericks. So big thanks to all of you. Uh, thank you so much to Lena who co-hosted this debate um, with me. Uh, very big thanks also to the sort of invisible labor that we can't see here, but to Lorenzo, Eva, Gabi, and Kat behind the scenes who are kind of keeping the whole machinery going, as well as to the rest of the Degrowth Talks team who've helped us um, promote this and, and plan this debate and put it all together. Uh, and lastly, a big thanks to the audience. Thanks for tuning in. Um, check out our other Degrowth Talks. Check out whatever is coming up in the future. Um, again, check, check, you know, watch this space tomorrow as we're rolling out the first Degrowth Small Talks. Um, and thanks again for everyone who sent in questions, comments, and uh, their limericks. And have a nice evening, everyone, and goodbye. Bye, good night. Goodbye.